What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. We are continuing our kinesiology lecture series, uh, looking at basic biomechanics. I apologize, it's been a little while since my last lecture. If you've been following along, we finished upper extremity. Our last lecture was on the wrist and hand. So now we're moving into lower extremity and we're going to work from the top down. So we're going to look at hip today, then we'll go on to knee, and then we'll do ankle and foot. And then uh, we'll have a couple of lectures after lower extremity, one just on gait. So if you're interested in the human walking cycle and the biomechanics of human gait, that's a good one. And then we'll also look at one on uh, functional lower quarter biomechanics where we look at the influence of the hip um, and its effects on the knee and research there. It's an area I've spent a lot of time studying. So that's kind of the rest of uh, the lectures for this course, so lower extremity and then some other kind of lower extremity, lower quarter specific um, lectures. So let's jump in here into the hip. We'll kind of do like we did in the other joint regions, look a bit at structure, um, you know, the structure, architecture of the joint, and then how that affects function, and then towards the end look at some relevant pathologies. So when we look at just general functions of the hip joint, we would say uh, maybe one of the main ones is that it supports the load of the head, arms, and trunk. So the hip is uh, obviously a really important joint. It's really important, especially when we look at research, um, looking at how the hip controls alignment of the leg. So a lot of the knee disorders, for instance, that we look at actually get better when you train the hip. The knee is sort of uh, at the mercy of the hip, you know, so that ball and socket joint, the hip joint, is really going to help control the alignment of the leg. The foot also plays a role, obviously, but the hip has a huge influence on the position of the knee. And again, training the hip often helps the knee. So force transmission is a, is a big one. If you think about how large the glute muscles are, they're extremely important in terms of generating force, transmitting force through the kinetic chain. So just a ton of research out there on the hip. I mean, almost for any lower body condition from the low back down, implementing hip strengthening exercises particularly can be really helpful. And then locomotion. So again, we'll look at after these lower extremity lectures, we'll get into looking at the gait cycle, but the hip joint and the muscles around the hip are obviously, again, really important for walking. And there are certain sort of normal ranges that the hip has to go through, both through flexion and extension. And the way that muscles like gluteus medius and gluteus minimus work to stabilize our pelvis um, as we walk. So we'll look at those in more detail in the gait lecture. Okay, when we look at the pelvic girdle and sort of just general structure, we would say that you have two coxa or innominate bones. These are the two bones of your pelvis. So Oftentimes we think of the pelvis as just one structure, but it's really two innominate bones coming together. And those bones come together on the front side at the pubic symphysis, which if you remember back to our joint categories, this is considered an amphiarthroidal joint, which means it's slightly movable. It's not like a synovial joint like our shoulder or our hip joint. It's uh, not freely movable in that way. It's a, it's a slightly movable joint. And then on the back side, a lot of people have heard of these joints, the SI joints, our sacroiliac joints. These are synovial joints. They're on either side of our spine. We have a right and a left synovial or sacroiliac joint, and you hear about people having SI joint pain. The thing to remember with the SI joints is that even though they're synovial, freely movable joints, they only move a few millimeters. So a lot of times people think of these as being very common uh, in terms of creating back pain or sometimes people wonder about how to stabilize their SI joints but really they don't move that much and um, oftentimes they get sort of over, SI joint pain is sort of maybe over diagnosed. It can account for back pain but it's thought to maybe be a smaller percentage. So uh, just a little bit about that, those joint areas and how the anomic bones come together to form this portion of the pelvic girdle. And then when you look at the innominate bone itself, it has three fused bones. And so if you, you have two innominate bones coming together to form your pelvis, if you take just one of those innominate bones, it has three portions that, that fuse together like 
the skull bones. So we have the pubis, the ilium, and the ischium. And this is just sort of to know it can be helpful, especially if you're studying origin and insertion points for different muscles. They will attach on different portions of these bones. Or if you're wondering where certain hip ligaments are, these can be helpful to know. So just to have just to help you know a little bit more about the structure. And then when we look at the hip joint, if you think about a joint, you have two bones coming together, right? In the hip joint, on the pelvic side, the socket part of the hip is called the acetabulum. And that acetabulum is part of the pelvis. So remember, every joint has a concave and a convex portion. So the hip, like the shoulder, a ball and socket, the concave portion is the acetabulum, which is part of the pelvis, and then the convex side will be the femoral head. So we've got the acetabulum and the femoral head, and we'll look more at the orientation and structure of the acetabulum. So here, just a nice way to see these three bony regions that fuse together. So we have the ilium. So here's a one anominate on one side, right? So if we're looking here, as you're looking at the screen, the left anominate and then the right anominate. And the top bone here uh, is the ilium, and then we've got the ischium down below. A lot of times you've people have heard of the ischial tuberosity. This is where the hamstrings originate. And then here we have the pubis, and you might think about you know the adductor muscles, your groin muscles originate here. This is right where the pubic symphysis would be, so that there's a fibrocartilaginous disc uh, right here at the pubic symphysis. And um, so, again, that matches up with the pubis bones. And then, uh, you know, the SI joints, if we were looking at the backside from the back, we'd see the SI joints where in between the sacrum and the ilium. So there are these small joints right back here. Okay, so just to give you kind of a visual of the innominate bones and the three bones that fuse together to make the innominate. So when we look a little bit more at the acetabulum, again, that's the socket. The acetabulum is normally, it points out to the side, slightly forward and down. So the socket of our hip joint faces to the side, which makes sense, right? Our legs are on the side, they're hooking in there. So it's gonna face laterally, slightly forward or anteriorly, and then down a bit inferiorly. So that's our normal orientation, but that can change in some people which is why you see a lot of these posts and conversations about that when you do an exercise like squats, not everyone is gonna have their legs in the exact same position. Some people, because of the structure of their pelvis, the bony structure, they might be more comfortable with a wider stance, you know, like a sumo squat, or some people might be more comfortable with their feet pointed forward and neutral, and some people might be more comfortable slightly externally rotated. So some of that can be um, can be based on just the structure of your pelvis, the bony structure. So there are different conditions that can happen where if the normal orientation of, of the socket, the acetabulum, is angled differently, we'll give this different names. So one is acetabular antiversion, which basically means the angle of that orientation is more forward. So this, the acetabulum is already facing anteriorly, but this is one where it's facing even more anteriorly. So here are the normal ranges. Males are normally around 8 degrees. Females are usually around 14 degrees. If it's above those values, then we'd call it acetabular antiversion. This is associated with reduced joint stability in the hip and early onset of osteoarthritis. So not in all cases. Obviously, these things vary but it is associated with with those um, the development of those kind of conditions and then we also have acetabular retroversion which is just a decrease in that angle again just want to point these out so you've got the acetabulum which is that concave portion of the joint it's on the pelvis side it has this normal angulation where it's lateral anterior and inferior but it can be directed more anteriorly or posterior from that sort of normal position and we would call that antiversion and retroversion of the acetabulum. I like this. This is just a nice image to get an idea. Again, you can see the innominate bones coming together right here, and then just a nice picture of the acetabulum. And you can kind of visualize here how that acetabulum is facing out to the side, slightly forward and slightly down. So that's sort of the normal position. If it faced more forward, we'd call it antiversion. If it faced rotated backwards more, we'd call it retroversion. So it's kind of the normal angulation here.
And this is also a nice one for seeing the labrum, which we'll talk about in a second. The labrum that surrounds our hip joint, this piece of cartilage that some, you know, you can have injuries in and tears, but it helps to give stability to the joint like the shoulder labrum. Let's talk, so on that topic, here's a great picture. This is from Chicago Sports Doc. Uh, on Instagram, he has amazing cadaver dissections, so check his account out if you're on Instagram. But just a nice cadaver dissection of that labrum of the acetabulum here, just the hip socket, right? So this is the socket when you remove the ball from it, just a really nice, smooth, concave structure. This transverse ligament also sort of uh, joins in with the labrum and just deepens the socket and gives it more stability. So. The acetabular labrum is a piece of fibrocartilage. It's this wedge-shaped fibrocartilage. It's like the meniscus in our knee, the labrum in our shoulder, the discs in our, our spine. They're all fibrocartilage. It's just a type of cartilage. And again, it serves to deepen the socket and incre increase the concavity of the acetabulum. Essentially, it helps the joint fit together, fit together better. So it just gives stability to the hip. The hip is a super stable joint, more stable than the shoulder because of how deep this socket is and how well things fit together. Okay, and then uh, again, this transverse acetabular ligament, it's technically considered to be part of the labrum, but it's interesting in that it doesn't contain chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are the base cell of cartilage, so it's listed as a different structure as a ligament because it doesn't have those chondrocytes like the rest of the labrum does and like we'd see in other fibrocartilaginous structures. So. Kind of an interesting, it sort of looks like the same thing, but technically it's a bit different. Here's just a video I took years back, uh, and um, just a neat one to see how the socket, how the hip fits together. So obviously we've got the femoral head here, and then the labrum. There's actually a tear in the labrum right here, you can see, and you can see how that labrum goes around the perimeter of the joint and just how deep the hip socket is. So you can imagine, I think from a video like this, it's pretty easy to see why that joint is so stable. So just uh, really cool how well these structures fit together and just, um, I don't know, I'm always amazed at the architecture of our joints. But again, you can see the labrum adds stability. If there were a tear in the labrum, it would compromise our joint stability. Okay, so when we look at uh, other structures involved in supporting the joint and giving it stability, uh, like other synovial joints, we have a joint capsule. In the hip, it's really strong and dense. It's a major contributor to joint stability. Unlike our shoulder, you know, we have a joint capsule on our shoulder, but because our shoulder requires so much stability, the joint capsule doesn't contribute as much to joint stability. The, the joint capsule on the shoulder is much more lax and has a much greater volume to allow for that large range of motion. Then the hip, the joint capsule is tighter, which means our hip doesn't move as much of our shoulder, but it, and it's also more stable. Okay, and then we've got a bunch of strong ligaments around the hip, and I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail on them, but they help to reinforce the joint capsule. Like other ligaments in the body, they help to restrain and check motion to help stabilize the joint and prevent damage from peripheral, other peripheral joint structures. So just a few, we've got the iliofemoral, pubofemoral, ischiofemoral, and the ligamentum teres. These ligaments all, again, primary function of providing stability to the joint. Just an image of these, the ischiofemoral on the back side, the posterior side of the joint, you can see the ischiofemoral. You have the pubofemoral, they're named basically from the bone a uh, portion of the innominate bone they go to, and then they all go to the femur. So they all end in femoral because they're going out to the femur. Ischiofemoral is running from the ischium over to the femur. The pubofemoral is running from the pubic bone to the femur. And then iliofemoral is running from the ilium to the femur. Sometimes the iliofemoral ligament is referred to as the Y ligament because of this split. But again, they help to reinforce the joint capsule and um, just really add a bunch of stability to our hip joint. So when we look at the bone, there are some interesting features of the hip of the hip joint, and uh, this will mainly look at the femur side. So uh, 
we're looking at the ball as it goes into the socket, but we see this trabecular system, which is present in the head and neck of the femur. And what's really important about it in the femur is that it helps to resist bending stresses that occur on the femur. And if you imagine all of this weight, HAT stands for head, arm, and trunk. Remember we talked before about how one of the functions of the hip is to support the head, arm, and trunk. So that load, if you imagine you have a ball going into the socket and then all this weight up above, it can create this bending force on the femur, especially when you're standing on one leg, which happens to us all the time, right? Every time we walk, there's a period of single limb stance where we're on one leg and all of our head, arm, and trunk weight is on one leg. And we need this trabecular system, or you may have heard of it as spongy bone. Spongy bone versus compact bone. The spongy bone has a greater ability to bend and to strain and change shape. Compact bone can't do that as much. It'll fracture easier when you try to bend it. So this uh, trabecular system in the hip is really important for resisting that bending stress um, because of all the weight that is on this area. There is a zone of weakness though in the femoral neck where the there are fewer, when the trabecular fibers cross each other at a 90 degree angle, they are stronger and able to resist more of this bending force. In this zone of weakness, there's less of these fibers crossing each other and because of that, we're more likely to see fractures in this area. So, you know, it's an area where with falls, if someone falls on their side, um, you know, different types of hip fractures, you can see them in this zone of weakness. And uh, if you know, you know, if you following this research, hip fractures in the older population are a major problem, right? A lot of people um, go on to die uh, after, within a year, I think something like 30% of older individuals who suffer a hip fracture die in the following year because they end up becoming fearful um, and then they become more sedentary and their whole body becomes more deconditioned and they get weaker. So it's but these fractures often happen in this femoral neck where there's this zone of weakness. Here's just an image so you can see how all these trabecular fibers cross each other. There's some kind of going this direction, some going the other direction. And when they cross each other at 90 degrees, that's where they're said to be the strongest, the best at, uh, at accepting this bend, the bending force from the head, arm, and trunk. But in the femoral neck, which is this region, there is decreased crossing of these trabecular fibers and that's where this zone of weakness is present. So you can see over here, maybe we see more of them crossing. And again, this is referred to as spongy bone. So the spongy bone is kind of inside, it almost looks like a sponge. And then on the outside, we have the compact bone. The compact bone will fracture more easily when you try to bend it. The spongy bone can really take that bending, but again, we have this zone of weakness. The femoral neck is right in here, so we have the femoral head and then we have this femoral neck that really connects it to the shaft of the bone. So that's where we have that zone of weakness. It's just a normal part of anatomy. You know, but the great thing is that when we look at studies uh, that involve jump training, uh, weight-bearing type exercise, and resistance training, they help to increase bone density. And I've posted on this before. So one of the areas they study when they look at increasing bone density is right here in the femoral neck and in the femoral head. So with resistance training, jump training, um, weight bearing type exercise, it helps to improve bone density and strength of the bone here, which can help prevent fractures. So important to implement those interventions and those types of training. Okay, let's look at osteokinematics. So in the hip joint, it's important to know the range of motion available. So with hip flexion or pulling your knee to your chest, it's normal for the joint to move to about 120 degrees. This is with the knee bent. You have to make sure the knee is bent. If the knee is straight, the hamstrings will be stretched and then you won't see the full joint range motion. So you bend the knee and then bring the knee towards the chest and that will move up in most people to around 120 degrees of hip flexion. In terms of extension, we have about five to 30 degrees. You can see more uh, variation in this if people are tight in their hip flexors. Hip abduction, moving your leg out to the side, should be about 45 degrees. Adduction, you should be able to cross your leg over the other leg, so you get about 20 to 30 degrees. And then 
If you look at textbooks, they'll say that internal and external rotation, turning the hip in for internal rotation, turning out for external rotation, should both be about 45 degrees. You really don't see that uh, very often in people. Usually we'll see external rotation to 45 degrees because we're used to turning our legs out to sit with our legs crossed and things. But internal rotation, especially in males, is usually more about, you know, maybe 15 to 20 degrees because, um, you know, probably we just don't use it a lot. Uh, you just don't see very many people where they actually have a true 45 degrees of internal rotation. So that's an area sometimes we're working on and mobilizing with people if they have hip joint related pain. Okay, so those are the six motions, just like the shoulder. All the same movements you've got available at the hip, you have at the shoulder, both the ball and sockets have these six movements. When um, we talk about, so this really, these movements have to do with the ball of the hip joint, right? You have a ball and socket. They have to do with the ball moving inside the socket. So it would be like if you grab someone's leg and moved it. These are the things you can measure with a goniometer. But we could also think about the socket moving on the ball. So this would be the opposite. So we talk about the pelvis moving. So this would be like anterior and posterior pelvic tilt. Maybe you've heard of those things. Sometimes people are worried about, oh, I have too much anterior tilt, or how can I get more posterior tilt, things like that. So that's the pelvis, the socket moving on top of the femoral head. And these are going to have different terms. So normally, we, when we look at normal, just static standing posture, most people have about 12 to 15 degrees of anterior pelvic tilt. So if you grab their pelvis, it would be tilted forward slightly. That's normal. Anterior pelvic tilt is the normal position. Again, there's some very vari some very uh, variation here. Not everybody has that exact position, but that's kind of the average: 12 to 15 degrees of anterior pelvic tilt. So if we look at, uh, you know, if, hopefully most of you have heard of open chain, an open chain exercise or an open chain movement. This is one where your foot is not fixed to anything. So it'd be like if you were just lifting your leg up um, and your foot's not connected to the ground. Or maybe you're laying on your back and I'm moving your leg. It's an open chain movement like that. If we look at open chain movements, if I go through hip flexion, so if I bring my knee up toward my, towards my chest and my hip, my foot's not fixed to the ground, as I get to the top of that movement, my pelvis will go into posterior tilt. It's just, this is just the normal biomechanics. So, as the, if we remember before, the hip flexes to 120 degrees, if I go past that 120 degrees, if I try to pull my knee to my chest and keep pulling it, once my hip runs out of range of motion, then my pelvis will go into posterior tilt to give me more, and my low back will round. I'll get lumbar flexion. The opposite is true of hip extension. If I were to move my leg way back, if I were to stand up and kick my leg back into hip extension, once I run out of that normal hip range of motion, then my pelvis will go into anterior tilt and my spine will go into extension. So this is called lumbopelvic rhythm. We'll look at it a little more specifically on a future slide, but this is what happens with open chain mechanics. And then we have closed chain mechanics. This would be if I was standing with my feet fixed. So if I was standing and moving through these different movements. So for this, if you think about posterior pelvic tilt, maybe I can kind of demonstrate if I go into posterior pelvic tilt, I tuck my, squeeze my glutes and tuck my pelvis under, that will create relative hip extension. It's like my hip is kind of doing this. So here's open chain hip extension. That's the, that's the ball moving inside the socket. If I do posterior pelvic tilt, that's the socket moving on the ball. And so I don't know if you can see that, but when I create posterior pelvic tilt, it creates a bit of hip extension. And the opposite is true. If I go into anterior pelvic tilt, it creates a bit of hip flexion. This angle gets smaller. It's sort of like me doing this. That's open chain hip flexion. Closed chain hip flexion happens when I create anterior pelvic tilt. So it's just the difference between, in one situation, I'm moving the ball inside the socket. In another one, I'm moving the socket uh, on top of the ball. So hopefully that makes sense. If you, haven't turn a, if you haven't heard of open chain and closed chain mechanics or open chain and closed chain exercises, I encourage you to go learn more about that. It's an area that confuses a lot of people. But just remember, closed chain means that the distal end, so if it's my hands or my feet, are fixed. Like a push-up is closed chain. 
okay, uh, versus something like a dumbbell bench press is open chain because my hands aren't fixed to anything. A squat is closed chain. Um, you know, standing, doing like a leg extension machine, that one is more of an open chain movement because the distal end of the limb isn't really fixed. Okay, so open chain and closed chain. Oh, and then we have lateral pelvic tilt. If I tilt my pelvis laterally, I'll get abduction, adduction in my hip joint. This will come up more in the gait lecture. This, um, if people have a weak gluteus medius, it can create lateral pelvic tilt and adduction of their limb, and we'll look at that. We call it contralateral pelvic drop, but it's something that can happen if you have a weak gluteus medius, or like maybe you've seen a Trendelenburg gait where people kind of lean, and that's often associated with weak, a weak gluteus medius. And then right pelvic, uh, if you look at pelvic rotation, so again, if I'm standing and I go into pelvic rotation, I'm going to get a different, one leg is going to go into internal rotation and one to go into external rotation. You guys, you can't see my feet here, but if I turn to the left, this left leg is going to go into internal rotation. If I'm keeping, keeping my feet fixed on the ground, this leg goes into external rotation. And then if I rotate to the right, I get the opposite. My right leg goes into internal rotation, my left goes into relative external rotation. Just because of how my spine is rotating, it's going to create those rotations in my hip joints, opposite rotations. So these are all closed chain because my feet are fixed to the ground. And again, just the opposite, left and right pelvic rotation. And, you know, again, see each leg go into opposite rotations. Here are some pictures of those, um, basically showing, you know, how if I create anterior or posterior tilt, so here, if I tilt my pelvis forward, I get hip flexion. If I create, if I put my pelvis into posterior tilt, I'll get hip extension. Um, so sometimes these can be helpful to kind of see lateral. We have lateral pelvic tilt and then abduction, adduction of the joint. And then again, if we create pelvic rotation, looking from the top down, we'd see internal and external rotation of the femur of the hip joint. So. Hopefully that visual can kind of help you think through it a little bit. And again, this is nice because it has our planes of motion, so sagittal plane. Anterior and posterior pelvic tilt occur in the front and back, the sagittal plane. Lateral pelvic tilt, just like hip abduction, adduction, occur in the frontal plane. And then rotations occur in our transverse or horizontal plane of motion. Okay. In terms of pelvic motions, we want to kind of think about what are the four primary muscle groups involved in these movements. Sometimes this can be helpful if you've got somebody with excessive anterior pelvic tilt and it interferes with their performance or maybe they have back pain. You want to think about, well, what muscle groups would you address? So there's four. So we're going to think about our spinal extensors on the back side of our spine. Our extensors are the opposite of our abs, right? So here are the abs, spinal flexors. Here are our spinal extensors. Your spinal extensors, if they pull and up on the pelvis, that would cause your pelvis to roll forward into anterior pelvic tilt. The spinal flexors, on the other hand, if you contract your abs, they'll pull the front side of your pelvis up, kind of tuck your butt under and create posterior pelvic tilt. Your hip flexors here, if they contract, they will pull again, pull the front side of the pelvis forward and create anterior pelvic tilt. And then your hamstrings and glutes back here will pull the pelvis posteriorly and create posterior pelvic tilt. So really, your, hand, your hip extensors, your hamstrings and your glutes work together with your abs to create posterior pelvic tilt. Your spinal extensors and your hip flexors work together to create anterior pelvic tilt. So if you had somebody with excessive anterior pelvic tilt, what you might try and do is stretch out their hip flexors. Usually we don't have to stretch the low back muscles, but maybe they've got a spasm going on there. Maybe you're doing some soft tissue, but Maybe you're thinking about kind of making these two areas more mobile and using their abs and their glutes. If you squeeze your abs and your glutes, you can create more posterior pelvic tilt. So maybe you're teaching them how to use their glutes and abs to slightly tilt the pelvis posteriorly while also stretching the spinal extensors and the hip flexor. So I think this can sometimes be useful. We don't want to get too crazy about this. You know, there was the whole upper cross and lower cross syndrome and, you know, we... Those things are a little bit less relevant nowadays when we think about pain, but sometimes changing these positions can help people with back pain or hip pain. So 
I think it's nice to know what are the major muscle groups involved in creating these movements. Uh, so when we look at the arthrokinematics, basically these are the accessory movements that go on in the joint. Um, I, you know, these are, again, these are pretty challenging. It really takes more time to kind of go through these. So don't stress about it if you, these still don't make sense to you. When I'm teaching this in a normal semester, we spend weeks going through this and pra doing different problems to practice these. So you know, when we look at an, a closed chain movement, the acetabulum, so we, again, the closed chain, we're thinking about posterior and anterior pelvic tilt. If you think about posterior pelvic tilt, that is the pelvis moving on the femur, right? So if I tilt my pelvis posteriorly, I'm going to get, I've got the socket, right? The socket, the acetabulum, and the femur. So say this is posterior pelvic tilt. That creates a roll and glide posteriorly versus if I go into anterior pelvic tilt, I get an anterior roll and glide of that concave structure, right? Because here we're talking about the concave acetabulum and every joint's got a concave side and a convex side. So if we're talking about closed chain movement, we're talking about the acetabulum moving and that's the concave side. If you think back to previous lectures, we know that the roll and glide occur in the same direction with a concave structure. So again, I know this is probably the hardest part of this lecture, so don't stress about it. You can just skip this slide. It's, you know, again, we spend weeks on this in a normal semester. If we look at open chain movements where the femur is moving, this is the convex side of the joint. Convex bones have opposite roll and glide. So if we look at hip flexion, we'd see anterior roll and posterior glide. And hip extension, we'd see posterior roll, anterior glide. I'm just going to kind of move through this quickly because it's really hard to explain in a quick lecture like this. So just skip this slide if it's really confusing to you. Uh, in joints, we have a closed pack position. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but this is basically the position where the bones touch the most. It's where the joint's going to be most stable. So for the hip, the maximum point of congruency is in a position of hip extension, abduction, internal rotation, almost like kind of like a back kick leg back and extension out to the side and then internally rotated. That's where the bones will touch the most and it's where the joint's going to be most stable. Uh, open packed is where the joint is going to be, there's going to be less contact between the bones. This is our, people will often want to put their joint if it's painful or swollen. So for the hip, it's a little bit of flexion, a little bit of abduction, and then slightly turned out. So you can imagine if you really, it's where a lot of people feel very comfortable with their joint. You know, maybe if you put kind of a pillow under your knees, you had your leg out to the side, turned out a little bit. So you can sometimes use this open pack position if you have someone who has a painful joint or it's really swollen. You wouldn't want to keep them for, there forever, but it might be a way for them to get comfortable. Lumbopelvic rhythm. This is kind of like in the shoulder. If you remember in the shoulder, we talked about scapulohumeral rhythm. In the lower body, we have lumbopelvic rhythm. And this is helpful to us because it allows us to bend over and pick things up. Um, that's where we see it a lot, but basically it's a combined motion of the hip, pelvis, and the low back, the lumbar spine. So if you look at this, just like we talked about a second ago, if somebody bends forward, we see hip flexion here, anterior pelvic tilt, and lumbar flexion. So these movements are all working together. We have lots of flexion going on. Hip flexion, low back flexion, lumbar flexion, and anterior pelvic tilt. That allows us all three joint regions work together so we can bend down. Now, if you're teaching somebody to deadlift, we often, when there's a lot of load on the system, we don't want to create ipsy-directional lumbopelvic uh, rhythm. We often, in those situations, right, we teach people to keep their spine extended as much as possible, even though it's still going to flex to some degree. We try to keep the spine towards neutral, which for the low back, neutral is extension. So when somebody's deadlifting, especially a new weightlifter, we might still have anterior pelvic tilt and hip flexion, but we teach them to kind of keep their spine in neutral more towards extension or contra-directional lumbopelvic rhythm to kind of protect their spine. So this would be that contra contralateral kind of uh, direction where the spine stays extended while they get anterior pelvic tilt. So if this person bent over to deadlift and kept their spine in more of a neutral position, <clears throat> that would be sort of fighting normal mechanics to protect your spine. So I hope that, that makes sense. This is kind of just normal how we bend over without thinking. This might be how we do it if we were trying to kind of protect our back 
with something with heavier load like a deadlift. There's just um, kind of a real-time picture of it. So basically when you bend over to touch your toes, you get those three joint movements, lumbar flexion, anterior pelvic tilt. Usually this will go to about 90 degrees, and then <clears throat> hip flexion. Really, the ability to touch the ground is because of the lumbar flexion. So we get these two movements. If you kept your spine straight, you wouldn't really be able to touch your toes usually. So because of this stop at 90 degrees. And again, that really depends on how flexible your hamstrings are. If you have really tight hamstrings, you probably won't get 90 degrees of anterior pelvic tilt. You see that in a lot of people with tight hamstrings. So people with tight hamstrings will have to round their spine even more to touch the ground. Okay, again, so just how those three joint regions functionally work together to allow us to achieve maximum range of motion. Okay, a few pathologies. A huge one in the hip is uh, osteoarthritis. And this is a degeneration of the joint surface, specifically the hyaline cartilage that covers the ball and socket joints, the articular cartilage. Remember in synovial joints, it's hyaline cartilage. And this, uh, there are different types. There's primary, which is age-related. This is thought to be 10 to 15% of those who are greater than 55 years of age. So, you know, the treatment for this, there's, you know, strengthening and mobility work. But these are the types of things where, like the knee, this is where we see a lot of total joint replacements. So if they have, somebody has a really severe cartilage wear, then we'd see a joint replacement. The secondary type is that there's some trauma or maybe some malpositioning, like we talked about retroversion, antiversion. I also didn't talk about you can have antitorsion and retrotorsion. Your femur can actually be twisted. So those things may speed up the arthritic process and maybe that contributes to arthrosis in the joint. Uh, certain risk factors, you've got increasing age, right? We, most people who have a total joint replacement are older. Trauma, if you have an injury to the hip joint, uh, maybe a car accident, antiversion, retroversion, your height to weight ratio. If you have more weight, uh, you know, your BMI is higher, that's increased load on the joint, that could wear it out faster. Also, inadequate cartilage compression. So being totally sedentary isn't good for your cartilage either. There's this rule of sort of moderation in life, right? So you want to not only do you not want to stress your cartilage too much, but you also don't want to be totally sedentary because that's harmful to the health of cartilage. So it's all about sort of, that's why now they say moderate dose running can actually be protective of your joints because that moderate, moderate level of stress actually helps keep the cartilage healthy. Okay, uh, here's an image. So when we look at the hip joint on an x-ray, this is a normal hip joint where you can see this cartilage space. See how there's a space in between the femoral head and the acetabulum? On this side, that space has gone away and that is a sign of arthrota, arth arthrosis. Also, the bone has become whiter on the x-ray, which means that it has hypertrophied. And uh, you see that with the development of arthritis as there's more stress on the bone, it sort of builds up and becomes denser there. But that's the big one we look for in x-ray is a loss of space. So if you see a loss of joint space, that points towards arthritis. So this side looks good. This one's got less. Okay, fractures. I already talked before about uh, how often we think about fractures. This is another thing in older individuals that can lead to a total hip replacement. But again, we have that zone of weakness, and you can have bony failure there. Um, this tends to happen in the 70s. 87% of cases are due to trauma, specifically a fall. And again, it's, you know, I want to say the stat is about 30% of people who have a hip fracture who are older die within a year because they end up becoming fearful of falling and then they become more sedentary. Being more sedentary leads to being more deconditioned and weaker. Reduced bone density, osteoporosis right, is reduced bone density. So if you're sedentary, your bone density goes down. And then if you get up and do move, you're more likely to fall because you become, become weaker. And if you do fall, you're more likely to have more severe things happen because your bones have weakened your muscles. So it's really important with people who have had hip fractures to get them moving again and strengthen their lower body uh, just to help, you know, reduce deconditioning, create hypertrophy in muscles, and to build bone density. We see osteoporosis more so in females, but most males and females as people get older. And so again, just really important to encourage people to incorporate weight-bearing exercises and resistance training their whole life. Here's a fracture right through that zone of weakness, see? So here's that femoral neck. There's the femoral head, there's the femoral neck. 
Same thing over here, there's the femoral head and we see a fracture right through that zone of weakness. So sometimes surgeons will come in and put some, you know, screws and plates in there to fix that. Sometimes the person actually needs a whole joint replacement or maybe just one side, a hemi arthroplasty where they just replace this side, the femur side, and they leave the acetabulum. It t depends case to case and how good their cartilage looks, but there is a pretty nasty hip fracture. Okay, so that's the end of it. I hope this is helpful. Next time we'll jump into the knee, and uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you all next time. Bye.